the untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph over the other side. Hitler knows he needs industry if he wants to build a war machine. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the Second World War was fought and won. The United States is about to launch the single greatest program of armament production in human history. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. The secret war of the factories that would decide the fate of the whole world. Gotta get back to work. Today, the Baltimore docks are quiet. The water is still, the quayside largely deserted. But on the 27th of September, 1941, these docks were thronging with people. Thousands of workers gathered to celebrate the launch of a new ship, the first of a new kind of ship that will change the course of history. They will be called Liberty Ships. Though they will play a key role in the Allied victory in World War II, only three Liberty Ships survive. Captain Brian Hope is dedicated to preserving this incredible bit of maritime history. Liberty ships are, the general category is a merchant ship. They're designed to carry cargo. Two-thirds of all the cargo that left the United States during World War II was carried in Liberty ships. Every conceivable kind of cargo, from beans to bullets, absolutely crucial to the winning of the war. If we didn't have a merchant fleet, then no victory. More than any other single vessel, the mass production of Liberty ships reflected the astonishing industrial might of America. Today, we have a little less than 100 American flag merchant ships. At the end of World War II, we had slightly less than 6,000 ships. It was a shipbuilding effort literally beyond belief. At the end of the war, their work done, Shipyards like this one would close or shrink. But in the war years, they would see a flurry of industrial activity, the likes of which the world has never seen before or since. The story of the American shipyard is the story of how the Allies won the war. But the story begins on the other side of the Atlantic. In the summer of 1940, Britain is fighting desperately to stay in the war. The speed of the German advance through northern Europe has caught the Western democracies completely off guard. France has fallen, and Britain's skies are overrun with Nazi aircraft. Its seas are patrolled day and night by wolf packs of ship-killing U-boats. In the summer of 1940, the German forces are across the Channel, and they've got much greater access for their aircraft and their U-boats and warships via Norway or via the French coast. So suddenly the war is on our doorstep. The threat goes up exponentially from 1940 onwards, particularly as Germany can produce more U-boats. The U-boat campaign leads to the sinking of a very considerable proportion of all British shipping and creates a potential crisis in the British capacity to import. Britain is a small island nation cut off from Europe, desperately relying on trade with America. Its merchant fleet is its lifeline. Without imports of food and supplies, Britain will collapse. But in 1941 alone, German U-boats sink 1,300 ships. Month after month, hundreds of thousands of tons of British imports are being sent to the bottom of the sea. In desperation, Churchill turns to the Americans. The British need freight ships, and they need them fast. Though America is not yet at war, it's willing to help its closest ally. But American shipyards are too few and too busy. They have no merchant ships to spare. So the British offer to pay for the rapid construction of new shipyards. The man they turn to is Henry J. Kaiser. In true American tradition, Kaiser is actually a completely self-made man. He had left school and skipped town when he was just 13, and within 10 years, he's running his own construction company. 
Kaiser had been in the interwar period a sort of a celebrity businessman. He'd worked on some of the great projects, these huge kinds of federal projects which changed the landscape. One of the largest things ever built by man was the Hoover Dam. Kaiser had no education and no training, but in the Hoover Dam, he built one of the great man-made wonders of the world. He'd started out with nothing, but he had an incredible natural talent for organization and a sheer bloody-minded determination to get on and make money. As war approaches, British and American governments will turn to men like Henry Kaiser to build their armies and their fleets. One of the basic decisions that the War Planning Board and the administration make is that they are going to encourage companies to produce the goods, materials they need by making it profitable for them to do so, by offering them generous contracts and terms which will give them a business financial incentive. So a large number of firms actually are set up during the war on the back of uh, taking on war contracts and then uh, delivering the goods, so to speak. One of the best known examples is the Henry J. Kaiser shipyards. Kaiser offers to build shipyards and then ships. Kaiser has barely been on a ship, let alone built one. But then he didn't know anything about dams, and that didn't stop him. He's not naturally a shipbuilder, but he's used to big, ambitious projects. And what he sees is an opportunity now to take his skills and move them into shipbuilding. Kaiser is not a qualified engineer, but understands the principles of mass production. He just needs a contract to prove that the same methods can be applied to ships. Kaiser meets with the British, who already have a design for a simple, basic freight ship. Based on the SS Empire Liberty, these designs would inspire the largest single class of ship ever produced, the Liberty Ship. They're described by President Roosevelt as ugly ducklings. So they are blunt ships, they are crude ships, they have relatively austere accommodation, they don't have great sea keeping, they don't have great speed, but you can produce them quickly and they will take a large volume of cargo for their size. Kaiser tells the British he can build them large numbers of Liberty ships in record time, but only if he's allowed to do it his way. The British are skeptical. Britain is the world's great naval superpower. They've been building ships for hundreds of years. Henry Kaiser, a man with no shipbuilding experience, is telling them he can do it better. Nevertheless, Kaiser gets the contract and buys land to build a new shipyard here, on the mudflats of Richmond, on the San Francisco Bay. Well, Kaiser is terribly ambitious and willing to take risks. So what he realizes is you need to set up the infrastructure to build the ship and you're building ships on a scale never uh, heretofore attempted. And he's willing to do that, starting in a sense from scratch, so he can change the productive process. Kaiser is told by engineering experts that it will take six months to dredge the Santa Fe Channel and clear enough land to start work on the shipyard. Kaiser's men do it in three weeks. Incredibly, Kaiser builds his first shipyard in just three months. It opens its gates in April 1941. It hasn't just gone up quicker than other shipyards. Ships will be made here like they've never been made before. He can see an efficiency in having a production system that is designed from day one to deal with the bringing in and assembly of subcomponents. Once this production line is up and running, it will be able to become rapid mass production. Kaiser's new shipyards will be unlike any other shipyard in the country because Kaiser is not a shipbuilder. Instead, he has modeled his yards on the warehouses of Motor City and the production lines of Ford and General Motors. These automobile companies completely changed the game in their own industry, producing motor cars for mass consumption. The processes they developed remain much the same today. America has been turning out, probably more than any other economy, a large number of very standardized products in large scale. And those methods are then applied to wartime. So effectively, this is providing Ford manufacturing production techniques to the shipbuilding industry. What the American production begins to favor as the war goes on is the idea of welding. So instead of putting all these rivets, you would actually use acetylene torches or different kinds of heat sources to melt the metal together. Riveting requires four men, welding only two. It takes six months to train a riveter, a welder only three. 
Welding allows Kaiser to turn shipbuilding into a production line, breaking up complex tasks into a series of simpler ones. Instead of crafting one ship at a time, Kaiser will mass produce them in sections, then weld them together. Once you move to sectional construction and welding, you can put together components from a wide range of places that are just brought together for the final construction, and so potentially you can speed up the construction of simpler ships very, very quickly. The man who built Boulder Dam has revolutionized shipbuilding. From blueprint to template, Henry J. Kaiser's West Coast Yards are sliding Liberty ships into the water as from an assembly line. A triumph of American genius and popular science. To the disbelief of traditional shipbuilders, Kaiser's first Liberty ship is constructed in just 124 days. Now, this new Liberty ship is assembled a bit like flat pack furniture, piece by piece. 95% of each ship would be pre-assembled. But you've got to remember, a 14,000-ton ship has a lot of parts. The finished hull of a Liberty ship is made of steel plates cut into no fewer than 435 shapes and sizes. Each ship contains 7,500 different mechanical components supplied by 600 different producers across the country. But by dividing up the production process and building ships in parts, a complex process is made simple. What the Americans do, essentially, is to apply the techniques that American industry had already developed to the mass production of consumer goods to the production of munitions uh, and war supplies. And so, essentially, it's the great triumph of American mass production capitalism. Liberty ships have kept Britain alive and in the war. Soon they will be transporting supplies to American troops abroad and vast numbers of American weapons and vehicles to help the Red Army. Liberty ships are absolutely critical in keeping uh, the Allies in the war. British fighter planes came over from America, Russian tanks, and, and most of them are carried on Liberty ships. Captain Brian Hope works aboard the Liberty ship, the SS John W. Brown in Baltimore. The John W. Brown is 75 years old, uh, and uh, she's not a spring chicken anymore, but we keep her in as good a condition as we possibly can. The space is called the tween deck, which means it's between the main deck and the ship's lower hold. Only on the inside of the Liberty ship does its scale become apparent. There we go. The SS John W. Brown staffed 45 merchant seamen and 41 Navy guards. Fully loaded, she could carry almost 3,000 jeeps. There we go. This is the number three lower hold. This is one of the five cargo holds on the ship. Uh, of course, it's empty now. We use it for storage, but when the when the ship was filled with cargo, the water line was way up near the top of this hold. This hold is actually one of the smaller holds on the ship, believe it or not. The purpose of the Liberty ships was to get cargo from the United States to the battlefronts, and the cargo was carried in these holds. So this hold represents the uh, victory for the Allies in uh, World War II. But across the Pacific, war is about to find America, whether they want it or not. Out of the clear blue skies on the 7th of December, 1941, almost 400 aircraft launched from a force of six Japanese aircraft carriers strike the American naval base of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Thousands of US servicemen and civilians are killed in the attack. Four US battleships are sunk, as well as 188 aircraft destroyed. This is far from the knockout blow that Japan was looking to land, but it serves to wake the United States from its non-interventionist slumber. The United States is about to launch the single greatest program of armament production in human history. America will never be the same again. The USS Arizona Memorial, Pearl Harbor, Honolulu. 
In the waters below lies the wreck of the Arizona, on which over a thousand American servicemen lost their lives. The attack on Pearl Harbor does not affect America's war production. Really, in the long term, all they've done is hack off all of the isolationists that didn't want America to go to war and ensure that it, basically you've poked the bear. Japan knows that if America can produce warships with the same mass production techniques they've used for the Liberty ships, they will be unbeatable. So Japan decides to strike first. The Japanese do see that the Americans have a vast rearmament program, which was voted in by Congress to expand the Navy and the Army and the, and the Air Force. But until that mobilization fully kicked in, which would be a couple of years, Japan had a window with its 10 carriers, would have approximately parity at the opening with the Western powers. Now, every month that you go past December 1941, the power ratio starts moving away from the Japanese. Four days later, Germany declares war on the United States. Against all its best intentions, America has been dragged into yet another world war. In January 1942, Roosevelt addresses the nation. He announces a vast expansion of the American shipbuilding program. These figures will give the Japanese and the Nazis a little idea of just what they accomplished in the attack at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt sees the astonishing progress made by the Kaiser shipyards. So instead of the Navy building ships, he plans to open up American shipbuilding to private industry. It's a way of thinking about the war productive effort as being like a competitive mass production market in which you have large firms which compete to supply the needs of this market. Consumer is the US government. Roosevelt's New Deal had been anti-business. It had suppressed competition and confiscated profits, regulated output and prices. Now, faced with war, all of these government controls have been swept aside. In every other country, war brings more government control. In America, it brings more freedom. And the results are electrifying. As Kaiser wins orders, he'll need to attract tens of thousands more workers. But the Richmond shipyard is miles from any major town or city. Well, there was a demand, of course, for uh, workers in all sorts of uh, war industries at the time. It truly was competition. Uh, there were great deals available to work in the aviation industry, building airplanes. So the shipyard workers uh, were offered better deals to come and work in the shipyards. To tempt workers to his shipyards, Kaiser introduces a healthcare scheme covering them and their families' medical costs for 80 cents a week. 91% of the employees subscribe, making it the largest voluntary health plan in America. Kaiser Healthcare begins as a way to protect his own workers' health. And from that, he creates a healthcare company. He basically franchises it out as a private insurance scheme. It still exists to this day. It's one of the best healthcare systems in America. With the offer of high wages, medical benefits, and the promise of learning a trade, workers flock to Kaiser's shipyards from all over America. This sudden explosion of industry is providing jobs in numbers the United States hasn't seen since the Great Depression. As Henry Kaiser's new shipyard expands, the population of the surrounding areas soars. The little town of Richmond experiences a population boom of over 600% in just three years. By 1943, it's grown to a town of 150,000. Kaiser and the Maritime Commission start work on the construction of 23,000 new homes to cope with the sudden migration of workers to the Richmond area. This didn't just involve putting up houses for 30,000 people in the middle of nowhere. This meant creating an infrastructure of ferries, buses, trains, anything nearby to help move people in order to get them to factories. Richmond shipbuilders topped the nation in the share of the ride principle, averaged more than four riders per car. Because of the shift patterns that everyone's working, it means that uh, cinemas, restaurants, bars, shops will need to be open 24-7. It really did create a lively place to be. 
They just treated the, the workers uh, exceptionally well. They advertised to a great extent uh, all over the country for uh, people to come and work in the shipyards. A lot of black workers were recruited from the South and they moved up to Baltimore. They were integrated very well into, into the workforce. There was a large proportion of women in the shipyards. Maybe close to 25% of the workers were female and they did just about every job in the shipyard. They ran cranes, they, they served as guards, uh, they drove trucks, they did all sorts of jobs. To accommodate the large number of women now working on the ships, daycare centers are introduced to look after the children. Women are free to work alongside their husbands, often for the first time in their lives. New schools are opened as well, and filled almost instantly by the children of shipyard workers. This is a time of incredibly rapid social change. America's Great Depression is finally coming to a close. In 1933, only 50,000 shipyard workers had been employed. Ten years later, 1.7 million people are working in shipyards across the country. Actually, funnily enough, standards of living in the United States actually increase quite dramatically after the beginning of the war. Everyone's in employment and wages are rising year on year. So actually, this is truly a sort of rebirth for America. But on the other side of the ocean, the Japanese stranglehold over the countries of the Asia Pacific grows ever tighter. Well, the Japanese are obsessed by the fact that they have a small island country with limited resources, and they believe to be equal to a great power, which is where they should be in the world, in their view, that they must have the resources of their own. Today, Tokyo is one of the largest cities on the planet. Now, as in 1940, built-up urban areas cover the islands of Japan. Like Britain, wartime Japan is not self-sufficient, either in food or raw materials. Instead, it would extract the supplies it needs from the populations of its new overseas colonies in China, Korea, and Southeast Asia. The Japanese are quite ruthless in how they get hold of all the raw materials and food that they need in that they just go out and pillage it from everywhere in the Pacific. And they're utterly reliant on their own merchant fleet to bring it home. To feed itself and maintain its empire, Japan needs to control Pacific shipping lanes. Without its merchant fleet, Japan's empire will collapse. What the Allies swiftly realize is that if they can disrupt Japanese supply lines, just as the U-boats had done to Britain, they'll be completely unable to sustain their war effort. Their many overseas colonies are going to count for nothing. America does have submarines with the range required to reach the Japanese merchant fleet, some 4,000 miles away, but it doesn't have many of them. This is the Gato-class submarine. The Gato-class submarine has been around since the beginning of the war. Um, the Americans have only ever produced a handful of them, and the reason is that they're completely labour-intensive and not geared up for mass production at all. For mass production to make economic sense, you need to be producing large numbers of identical items or machines. So if you're going to invest huge amounts of money in machine tools that only produce parts in small numbers, it's simply not worth the investment. That's common sense. When the designs are finalised, um, that's when you begin sending prototypes out to manufacturers. And to get them done in sufficient numbers and create a submarine fleet from scratch, they're going to have to employ Kaiser's methods. Before long, five different contractors are mass-producing Gatos across the country. The first Gato is completed in November 1941. In January 1942, American shipyards are producing two Gatos a month. By the summer, they are sending out a new Gato every eight days. The Gato class is America's first mass-produced submarine. The impact on the Japanese merchant fleet is felt immediately. Dozens of merchant ships are lost within a few months, disrupting Japanese supply lines and damaging military production. Submarines account for less than 2% of US naval vessels, but they will be responsible for 30% of all Japanese ships sunk. 
the United States submarine was a hugely important weapon of war in the East. They essentially destroyed the Japanese capacity to transport goods and troops uh, in the Pacific. Large parts of the Japanese Empire are effectively separated from Japan long before the end of the war, and Japanese ability to produce anything at home and even to feed the home island is falling catastrophically. For the loss of only 52 submarines, the fleet wipes out over a thousand Japanese ships, half their merchant fleet, five million tons of vital Japanese shipping. But to hit mainland Japan directly, something else, something bigger, will be needed. In the autumn of 1942, Roosevelt visits Kaiser's shipyard in Oregon. By now, Kaiser and the Liberty ship's success have become a national sensation. Roosevelt's tour of the yard is like a victory parade. Addressing the crowd, the president says, I wish that every man, woman and child in the United States could have been here today to see that launching and realize what it means in the winning of this war. At the start of 1942, the construction of a Liberty ship had taken an average of 210 days. By May, 156. By July, 106, and some are produced in just a few days. And Henry Kaiser is becoming a national celebrity. Jay Kaiser, the miracle shipbuilder, shows how his yards launch Liberty ships in record time. The man who cuts months to weeks. Now you're talking about ships being turned out, you know, in the matter of just over a month from the starting of a ship for getting it to sea in order to fit it out. In 1942, Germany produces 244 major vessels, Japan only 68. But this is dwarfed by the output of the US shipyards, which produce an incredible 1,854. Liberty ships have been great for keeping Britain and her allies in the war in terms of going across the Atlantic. Um, once the war in the Pacific explodes, they're no longer enough. Um, Kaiser's shipyards are going to have to up their production significantly once again. Pearl Harbor showed that naval warfare had changed. A modern navy needs planes. Battleships on their own are slow and vulnerable. The battleship's day had passed. The battleship was done. It could bombard beaches. But in terms of ship-to-ship -ship combat, Aircraft carriers were now the key weapons. So what Kaiser wants to show is he can now build those as well. The need for aircraft carriers is obvious, but carriers are enormous. The Essex class, the United States' favored ship, is 900 feet long. It weighs 30,000 tons and has a crew of 2,500 men. A single carrier this size takes literally years to build, and war in the Pacific will not wait. As the war goes on, though, these ships will take several years to produce and can only be in a handful of places working with the main battle fleet. So you start looking at what were called escort carriers. So they're much smaller and they're operating perhaps 20 aircraft compared to the 60 or 70 aircraft on a fleet carrier. Kaiser offers to build the Navy aircraft carriers the same way he builds Liberty ships. They'll be smaller than the Navy's existing carriers but Kaiser will build many more of them at a much faster rate. Kaiser is a self-made man, um, very rich man, very successful man, and there's consequently a lot of ego and bravado that goes with him. And when he goes to put a bid in front of the US Navy to produce escort carriers, he just rubs them completely up the wrong way with the result that they just turn him down flat. Kaiser has spent an entire career schmoozing Washington, so being rejected by the head of the Navy board is like, pfft. So all he does instead is just set up a meeting with Roosevelt and have another chat, and then with, with the instant result that he's uh, got a contract to produce 50 escort carriers. Kaiser's new mass-produced escort carriers would be known as Casablanca-class carriers. The Kaiser shipyard set to work immediately, organizing the most efficient production line possible for their new carriers. Every ship will be standardized, every part mass-produced, each ship running with reciprocating steam engines with four boilers. No variation, no frills, with lighter armor and increased speed. 
again, they can be made in a much wider range of shipyards, following the example of things like the Liberty ships. You're producing a simple ship that you can put a simple flight deck on, and you can operate for a limited number of tasks, 20 aircraft. So we have a kind of mass production of small ships rather than the building of a very few, very large ships. But shipbuilders build ships. They don't do lighting, they don't do radar, and they don't do radios. Within the ship's enormous outer shell, a vast infrastructure of electrical components needs to be provided. To assemble the inner workings of their ships, naval yards across the country turned to manufacturing giant General Electric. They churned out a lot. Ships radios, searchlights, winches, ammunition hoists. They even organized ventilation, steering control, and even radar equipment. Now, this coordination and cooperation between companies simply does not happen in a planned economy. What Kaiser says is that we need someone producing the lighting for his ships, and he goes straight to General Electric. He needs electrical components for cranes, he goes to General Electric. The Kaiser shipyards can only run because of this coordination with their many hundreds of subcontractors. The first aircraft carrier to be launched from the yard of Henry Kaiser. Now geared for mass production, America's miracle shipbuilder promises to deliver six carriers a month. General Electric and the Kaiser shipyards keep to their deadlines. They produce a staggering 50 escort carriers in two years. Over the course of the entire war, Japan only produces seven. Kaiser breaks all records. More Casablanca carriers are built than any other kind of aircraft carrier before or since and they wreak havoc in the Pacific. US fighter planes swarm the slow and hulking Japanese battleships. This is Chuuk Lagoon. It was once the main base for the Japanese Imperial Fleet. It is now home to the Ghost Fleet. Operation Hailstone, I'd say it's revenge for Pearl Harbor. Um, in 1944, 540 American aircraft um, take off from carriers and proceed to destroy the Japanese fleet. Over 200,000 tons of Japanese shipping is lost to the bottom of the sea and 17,000 tons of fuel destroyed. Operation Hailstone is the death knell for the Japanese fleet. The next step for the Americans will be invasion, but getting to dry land won't be so easy. By the middle of the war, American military production is dwarfing that of Japan. In 1943, Japan produces 122 major naval vessels. America builds a staggering 2,654. Identical ships with identical walkways unload identical stores in identical ways. Under this new production program, crews and troops need less familiarization and can operate more efficiently. But the fighting in the approach to Japan is brutal. In their advance across the islands of the Pacific, each landing is like breaching a castle. As the Allied troops try to land their ships on Japanese beaches, they're greeted with volleys of bullets. It's a bloodbath. Once you move to the Pacific, you can isolate the islands that the Japanese forces are on, but there's no deception about where you're going to land, and generally there are very limited areas. In the Pacific, as the Americans realize, you have coral atolls, you have much more difficult landing operations, often sort of smaller, patchier beaches. Reefs just offshore from the beach that can wreck normal landing craft coming in. The landings in Tarawa in 1943 end up being a disaster because they simply don't have the right charts. Troops get stranded, they get machine gunned in the water, they never get ashore. In the first stages of amphibious invasions, monthly US casualties increase by 1,000%. Something must be done to limit the American losses, and fast. The solution lies with a hard-drinking Irishman named Andrew Jackson Higgins, who lived and worked here in Bayou Country, Louisiana. 
Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Higgins had supplied the developing oil and gas wells. To service these sites, he had designed and built several shallow draft craft capable of carrying heavy loads in depths of less than two feet of water. Now, Higgins has read about the problems faced by the American troops in those early Pacific landings, and he realises that these boats of his could be the answer. They could actually save American lives. Higgins' boats are tested, effective, and can be easily mass-produced. But once again, the government's monolithic military bureaucracy has other ideas. Somewhat predictably, you've got these bureaucrats at the US Navy board who are absolutely determined to use the landing craft that they'd commissioned and designed internally, despite the fact they were obviously bad. So what they do is they continue to purchase thousands of these inferior internally designed ships, even though it's costing American lives. Now, this is a theme that you see going on throughout the entire war. You've got this real pushback of army bureaucrats against the expansion of military production into the private sector. Now, that, of course, is going against men like Higgins and Kaiser, who really know what they're doing. But Higgins, like Kaiser, is not easily beaten. He demands that Congress investigate the Navy board and wins a hearing with Senator Harry Truman. Truman himself was no great fan of the New Deal. And Truman was uh, certainly on the side of the conservative Democrats in the 1940s that thought that uh, the staunch Roosevelt Democrats had gone too far with government regulations. Truman calls for a head-to-head -head operational test, the Navy's boat versus Higgins. So what happens is when they pitch the two designs up against each other, uh, everything that Higgins would have wished for happens. So um, he shows the Navy designers up as, as vastly inferior. His design dazzles everybody. Truman is stunned by the corruption of the Navy board. He launches a full-scale investigation and concludes that the Navy board have shown a flagrant disregard for the facts, if not the safety and success of American troops. Higgins is awarded the contract to mass-produce his design. D-Day happens in June 1944. A few weeks later, the United States invades the Marianas Islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. They send a naval force 10 times larger to invade those islands than they send to D-Day. The US fleet has already grown to become the largest ever assembled. They're transporting hundreds of thousands of troops and tens of thousands of tanks, trucks, and transports. The problem is how to get this vast floating army ashore. You need to build more complex landing craft that can carry heavy loads. And you need to build those in a way that had never been conceived of before. And Kaiser, yet again, begins to involve himself in the building of these more intricate landing craft. The solution is the landing ship tank. LST is a landing ship tank, and it's... Oh, it's one of the best inventions of the war. They were designed in Britain, but they were manufactured in Kaiser's shipyards. Um, they can, they're, they're monsters. They're capable of uh, holding 20 tanks, um, 27 vehicles, and almost 200 men and carrying them all to shore. But these ships are 100 meters long and sturdy enough to transport dozens of heavily armored vehicles. The construction of this new design of ship will be no simple task. The building of LSTs is listed absolute top priority. The shipyards set to work immediately. Orders for materials have already been placed before the design is even completed. And before a test vessel has even been constructed, the blueprints are sent off and the contracts fought over and awarded. The Kaiser shipyards take one of the largest. Lack of planning is useful because it enables the whole productive process to be much more nimble. If you have a rigid plan with fixed targets, rigid designs as to what you're going to produce, how you're going to produce it, then if something unexpected happens or you find that something you're doing is not working, it's very hard to change course, to suddenly reallocate resources, retool factories. The whole system has a quality of much greater flexibility. April the 1st, 1945. The Americans are ready to launch what could be the decisive battle for the Pacific. The Battle of Okinawa, the largest amphibious assault in the Pacific theater of war. 
1,457 landing craft and warships approached the island of Okinawa. The size of the American force landing at Okinawa is astonishing. And the battle lasts almost three months, and in that space of time, 20,000 Americans and 110,000 Japanese are killed. It's the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. From here, the Americans have their platform to reach the Japanese mainland. On August 15th, 1945, Japan surrenders. The history of World War II is often depicted as a story of generals and wartime leaders of competing military strategies. But more than any war before or since, the Second World War was a war of production. And it would transform America, leaving it with a role on the world stage it had not wanted. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States has four aircraft carriers. By the end of the war, they have over 100. These are extraordinary epochal transformations in the capacity of the United States to act at a, at a world level. By the end of the war, the US Navy was very much larger than the Royal Navy. It's a great world historical transition that takes place. On the morning of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy had 17 battleships, eight aircraft carriers, 112 submarines, and no amphibious vehicles a total of 790 active naval military vessels. By VJ Day, the Navy had expanded to 23 battleships, 99 aircraft carriers, 232 submarines, and 2,547 amphibious vehicles. A force of staggering size, totaling 6,768 active naval military vessels. The US Navy accounted for 70% of the total naval force on the planet. But at the end of the war, the Richmond shipyard shut down. So did Bethlehem Fairfield. They had worked at breakneck speed for four years. They had changed the course of the war and of history. But their task was complete. The American shipbuilding program is symbolic of America's uh, pioneering spirit of industry at the time. 1.7 million Americans worked in shipyards during World War II. Um, today, that figure's dropped off by 95%, to about 100,000. It was truly an impressive uh, operation. We couldn't do it today. We couldn't even manage the paperwork today in the length of time that they, they built ships back then. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. While the United States Navy today is only a fraction of its size in 1945, it remains a dominant force in the world's oceans and seas.